Hello and welcome to Bridging Voices, the video podcast series by the Konrad Adenauer Foundation here in Brussels. My name is Aden Sorge. I'm a research assistant at Düsseldorf's Party Research Institute at Heinrich Heine University in the sort of Germany. And I'm very delighted to be joined by two experts today, by Mala and Dolga. Um, Mala, you are a Canadian international lawyer and have been working as an electoral legal analyst and advisor for many organizations. And Dolga, you are a Mongolian lawyer and consultant on the Mongolian constitution, electoral, electoral law and political parties. And both of you worked on a study that just has been presented here in Brussels a few hours ago called Strengthening Legal Frameworks for Political Parties, a result of a cooperation between the Konrad Adenauer Foundation and the Düsseldorf Party Research Institute. The study offers an in-depth analysis of um, developments in party law, electoral law, and uh, parliamentary law in five different countries in Venezuela, Thailand, Tanzania, South Africa, and Mongolia. And by comparing the findings from all five countries, the both of you and other, the other authors identified the potential of um, the legal framework for political parties as democratic actors in times of increasing international um, pressure. Our podcast is part of a dialogue program that aims to serve as a, a platform for um, talk, talking about our uh, findings. And I would like to start um, with Mongolia in our first episode. Personally, I think that Mongolia is one of the most fascinating countries at the moment with a one-of-a-kind geopolitical situation. Uh, Mongolia is landlocked by two countries we happen to have a lot of disagreements with, landlocked by China and Russia, and we see a shift in its geo geopolitical situation caused by Russia's invasion of Ukraine, but Mongolia remains highly dependent from Russia and China. And my first tough question would be, do you think that under those circumstances where two authoritarian countries as direct neighbors, a true democracy can arise and flourish? Right. Um, <coughs> thank you. Thank you for having us. Um, the only reason that we are um, independent from these two um, um, countries, China and Russia, is because we have democracy. Uh, but um, how long can we maintain that democracy is a question now. With the recent developments that we've been having in the political environment, um, it's coming to, um, well, it's, it's becoming a question now. Yeah. Um, I see that there are a lot of protests right now. Could you elaborate on that? What are those protests about? I, I think it's the youth that is protesting against the ruling party, uh, against the lack of diversity in its political um, society. Right. Um, so um, um, I, uh, I think there needs to be, I need to give a little bit of a background. Yes. Um, since 2016, um, the Mongolian People's Party, which was um, the ruling party and the only party for about um, 70 years before the democratic transition, um, they won a supermajority since 2016 for two terms now. And so um, with, um, with the, the ruling party governing all three important branches of the government, the president, the, the prime minister, the parliament, there have been many issues where the, um, where the voices and concerns of the citizens have not been heard or have not been considered. And besides that, there have been many corruption scandals related with the uh, ruling party, with the government officials, high-level officials, where the citizens have... Um, have have lost faith and just was fed up, and they were protesting in the um, on the square in like minus thirty five degrees, yeah. um, which was a chaos. But it was mainly the youth. Um, so so Mongolian uh, youth, Mongolian people have been sick of these um, corruption scandals and uh, have protested. Um, on the square, but besides that, have protested and demonstrated their dislike uh, on social media. Yeah. But as a result, just a few weeks back, um, the, the, the parliament adopted a law 
uh, that they passed in like in, in a few days okay. um, that tried to silence um, the, the people of Mongolia on uh, social networks, on the internet environment. Overall, do you think that there is trust amongst the youth, about uh, amongst the citizens of Mongolia in its democratic system, in its electoral system? Or is it some kind of not there at all? There's a growing disillusionment with the political, let's say, sphere in Mongolia, especially among the youth, as I understand. I mean, I worked in Mongolia in 2016. I haven't been back since, but uh, through my understanding, um, the people really are expecting uh, change and um, development in, in that respect. Uh, and the, the, their, the stagnation, the status quo of the uh, party politics is really uh, disillusioning. Where exactly do you see the need for reforms? Because I think I read that in Mongolia you have to be 25 years old to run for, to be elected for office. Mm -hmm. That's quite... I would say the youth is a uh, plays a key role in its mm -hmm. modernization. So why is there such a high um, um, age to be elected into office? So you think it should be younger than yes, of course, twenty five. Yeah, um, I think w in Germany, for example, you can be elected into office with eighteen years old. Mm -hmm. So you have a lot of um, your ideas can be mm -hmm. heard. Mm -hmm. And I see there is a lack of those mm -hmm. young people in office with new ideas in Mongolia. Is that is that the case? Mm. Okay. Well, um, I would put it this way: that um, so the the meaning of democracy is to govern by the majority, right? Many people they discuss, they uh, they, they 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 are engaged, they're involved. Um, That's that's the true meaning of democracy, but what we have in Mongolia, the, what we have in Mongolia, irrelevant of the age of the people who can be elected or who can be a uh, candidate, is that um, these decisions do not involve the public. Okay. Um, maybe whereas majority of the public um, are used to it the youth, young people, are not used to it. Their voices, their concerns, their issues should be heard at the decision-making level and should be considered. So um, that's why there has been so many um, conflicts, demonstrations. But I can add that um, political participation is not just about having the right to be elected. Yeah. And I think 25 is actually not considered you know, old for especially mm -hmm. national positions, mm -hmm. maybe for local uh, politicians, maybe it's a, it may be a bit, but, but it's... I think, for, sorry to interrupt mm -hmm. you, but in Germany, for example, we have a lot mm -hmm. of young people in our new German Bundestag that are elected into office, and we mm -hmm. see that is um, something the public identifies with, mm -hmm. young people with new ideas, and that is something I see in Mongolia that is some kind of missing, I guess. There's also a trend to lower the voting age, actually, yeah. in some countries to 16. Yes, it's true. Mm -hmm. But uh, in a country that doesn't have genuine public consultation in the, mm -hmm. um, in the political process, it, it has more meaning yeah. even. So I think they need to work on this genuine public consultation. They might not have the same disillusionment that's, that's happening. Um, yes, I think that that... that And is there something difference. specific that has to change in its electoral law? I think the consultation process, I mean, sometimes those are built into, um, let's say, the internal uh, regulations of a parliament, but it, there just has to be a political will to mm -hmm. consult with the public. And is there a political will amongst the political elite to change that? Mm -hmm. Well, um, by law and on paper, there is political will. But um, uh, to, to be honest, our constitution, our legal framework is, uh, compared to many countries, quite developed and quite, um, um, it, it guarantees human rights, um, fundamental rights. But when it comes to, um, to, to reality, when it comes to um, it being implemented, uh, we have problems there. And we can see see an example in in political party procedures. Actually, in political party activities, 
where the lead where, where it's a top-down approach where only the leaders or the top ranking um, officials of the political party make the decisions and do not consult or engage um, have the normal members be engaged uh, in decision making I read that uh, Mongolia is quite liberal in the fields of uh, LGBTQIA plus rights. Is that something that's also only on the paper or is that something that is truly lived in the society? We did have uh, conditions where they had to fight for. Uh, they, they have a protest or a march every year. Um, it's supported, but the, the government officials, police, they don't quite understand they give them some hard time, but it's but that's not saying that they're not accepted in the public. But um, and and by saying that, um, it's not. It doesn't also mean that they had the the privilege of this acceptance from the beginning. They had to fight for it. So so it's you know okay um, half half yeah yeah. Um, another topic we talked about trust in the s democ democracy and the political system. I would like to talk to you about the so-called social media. Um, what role do social media does social media play in the political daily life or in election campaigns? Is there a key role for social media? We see uh, in Europe, for example, a lot of pro or in the United States, a lot of problems with fake news. <coughs> mm -hmm. Is that something that is also in Mongolia? Yes. Yeah, so um, social media. So. Facebook is, uh, Mongolia is actually the, I think the number one country in Asia that uses Facebook. Okay. So basically everyone um, has Facebook uh, and, and some even multiple Facebook accounts. Um, and uh, we're a country where social media and, and Facebook especially is being used as the number one source of information, news, advertisements for even looking for jobs, even looking or trying to sell something online, y you know. So Facebook is used is being used for everything. So um, of course it is wise for political parties or even gov government institutions to um, promote their agendas or programs or anything on Facebook, and so it's widely used. And is it used as an instrument to press the position to? Um, talk about other politicians in a bad way or is it just used as something informative to share interests about well, politics? Where there's something good, there's always something bad. So, <laughs> um, so no, because it's widely used, there are fake news, there are um, trolls, trolls, right? Yes. Um, um, there are these teams of people who are hired just to just to comment badly or comment good on people's posts so that the um, they can shift or they can influence the public opinion uh, those tactics are being used quite a lot and um, there aren't any organizations that fact check uh, posts or information Except for one, but that only works during elections. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you talked about the uh, top-bottom approach in parties. Is there enough participation um, from the public in political systems, or is that something that is um, two different spaces? Like um, the public uh, goes into um, protesting, and the political parties are something else, and there is only the elite who is um, trying to. Um, bring their ideas to the table and the public is something else and um, not uh, heard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, this top-down approach, it existed for a long time. Um, maybe it, it even go ba goes back to the socialist period where everything was a top-down approach, where there was one party, where all of the decisions were made at the top leadership level. Um, and when, when we as a country transition to democracy we didn't uh, we only focused on overthrowing the old regime but not um, not on how to run the country in the future so that uh, top-down approach has been uh, maintained 
it, it was we still have a, a strong we still have a strong top down approach. And do you think that will change in the next decade? What has to be implemented for right. for the change? Right. And so unless uh, political engagement, uh, civil engagement um, in um, patient of normal members of political parties are encouraged or are strengthened, um, it's still going to be a top-down approach. Nobody asks for how and when a decision was made at the political party or at the government. For example, if it was a political party, then nobody asks uh, how it was made. Nobody asks for uh, accountability. Um, they just let it go, let it slide, because they didn't even know, and they weren't even involved. Um, this, is, this yeah. is one of the um, aims of the study, actually, is to try to address uh, some of these shortcomings in the political system. One of the outcomes and in our discussions today was to try and identify some of the areas where um, development projects could actually uh, help with enhancing the political systems, um, and the including the internal party uh, rules mm -hmm. um, you know, within the parties, not just... Uh, between parties or in parliament, but also within the parties, um, basically developing um, not just legal frameworks, but political maturity, capacity mm -hmm. building, and such. So, yeah, yes, we meet with a lot of politicians and think tanks today, uh, today. I think they will all ask, how can we help you? What has to be done? Is there an answer to that question? What has to be done on the level, for, on the ground? What has to be done? Can you elaborate on that? What has to be done um, right. in Mongolia by the people, I guess? Right, right. So, um, again, um, uh, this political engagement or participation of society of citizens is important. Um, but there is... Um, uh, it's not because uh, of uh, lack of political interest, but it's because there isn't a, a way for the citizens or the members of the political parties to be involved, uh, to, to raise their voices and concerns. Um, so maybe one, the first um, uh, cooperation that can be done with Mongolia, with Mongolian political parties, to strengthen the, the, the normal citizens where they hold the parties or the leaders accountable, where they ask for um, how decisions were made. Uh, or to be involved, to be engaged. Um, but in order to do that, they need to have information. So, um, and I, I, as I said, um, information is the currency of democracy. And so informing citizens or the members is, uh, is very important at this level, stage. Um, and uh, Mongolia is quite open, unlike Tanzania. Tanzania. Uh, unlike the other countries, um, Mongolia is quite open to um, cooperation, international uh, international cooperation and uh, implementing projects. Yes, I heard that there is a third neighbor policy. For example, the prime minister was in Germany meeting the chancellor. Right. How important are those diplomatic ties in the process? Right, and and because we have the third neighbor policy, yeah. you know, that's one of the reasons we... Uh, have maintained uh, independent um, from China and Russia, from its influences, um, and have managed to maintain the democracy that we uh, have had for about over 30 years now. But is it coming to... Is it, is it ending? Is democracy dying? At the same time, uh, whenever you have politics um, involved... It's very difficult sometimes to get cooperation. I mean, openness, yes, to start with, you have openness, but it's very sensitive because we're talking about power. And if, uh, if the development uh, work that's being offered or being discussed um, may impact on the politics, there may be some pushback. On um, So it, it, it's a very sensitive um, uh, way to design these projects so that, firstly, that they don't see it as partisan, because uh, they don't want uh, any pushback because of uh, perceived uh, partisan uh, on the, in the projects, and they have to feel that um, they are not that that this is, that it is going to be a win-win situation. Um, mm -hmm. 
countries. Yeah. And there's also a lot of work from, um, for example, German institutions in Mongolia and other institutions. Is there a value to it to help in this um, process? Or do you think it should be something that comes from the people itself? Or do is it valuable that we empower the people to, to see the change they want in their country? Mm -hmm. uh, well, um, for, for any cooperation, it's uh, the two parties or both parties, all parties agreeing to, to, um, to, to uh, implement the project and uh, reach or go towards a, a certain result. So, um, so it's, it's, not, it's not only having an international organization, an actor, go and try to persuade Mongolians in, in doing something, or it's not, it's not vice versa, where Mongolians are reaching out saying, we only want to do this and nothing else, you know, work with us or not. Um, it's it's uh, both sides coming to an understanding, and I think at this this moment um, we should understand that all of and Mongolia Mong parties in Mongolia and uh, the international community we want to strengthen democracy so that our um, human rights so that human rights um, fundamental rights are are protected guaranteed. You also talk a little bit about your academic work in Mongolia and this project. Um, you had a lot of problems with getting information from other countries. Is that something that is also a problem in Mongolia to get to the information that you needed, or is that something that it w wasn't a mm -hmm. problem at all in Mongolia to work with you? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Mongolia, well, and compared to many countries, is relatively ve um, relatively open. It um, uh, we we have many of the information, even court decisions. Uh, we have a a, a a portal, like a website yes. for court decisions that is available to the public. So anyone who wants to to go and look um, dive into these uh, information, uh, whether it's from government institutions or NGOs, uh, it's it's quite available. But with the current political um, developments uh, where we have the, the president, the, the prime minister, and the, the government, parliament, everyone's um, from the same party, this uh, one-party um, system is, is, uh, is, is coming very close. Uh, it might have come already, I'm not sure yet, but... Um, so since Mongolia is moving towards this one-party system and uh, the law that I just mentioned that tried to silence the, the people on social media and in the internet environment, I'm not sure if uh, this is going to continue, if this is going to be, if we're going to be transparent and open. Do you have any problems with that at all or is that something that you... Did not uh, well, experience. Well, we, I was working together with Dolga yeah. actually, so so we were we were working as a team, and um, she was able to get uh, all the answers to the questions that the the, the study um, leaders were asking us to, to research. We didn't have any trouble. Um, considering the considering the findings of our study, what do you say? What are the most challenging things Mongolia uh, faces in its way to a true democracy within the next years? Well, I could mention maybe one one issue is women, actually, the representation of women in parliament. If we're talking about women's representation as an element of true democracy, I would, I would say that that's one challenge. Uh, they have a very low representation of women in parliament, and uh, I, I think that's one area that, that, that needs to improve to go forward mm -hmm. that, that I'm aware of. Yeah. Mm. Are there any hopes you have for the process? Where do you see your country in the next <laughs> decade? <laughs> Well, so one of the the, um, the issues that we can see from the from the research that we did was uh, silencing opposition, opposition having no power at all in parliament because uh, with only eleven seats, um, opposition doesn't well the parliament doesn't even need the opposition to uh, to pass a law. So that's one of the um, uh, one of the threats that we saw from the research 
which has continued for two terms now, and it's likely to, to continue in the future if our opposition um, political party does not uh, come to an understanding in their internal conflict. Okay, so great challenges ahead. <laughs> <laughs> challenges yeah. ahead, yes. Okay, Mana Dolga, thank you for joining me and discussing the findings of the study. Um, I am very happy that we can discuss um, the findings of the study and uh, thank you for this great conversation. Thank you for all the listeners here in our video podcast. Um, we kindly invite you to follow the work of the Konrad Adenauer Foundation and the Düsseldorf Party Research Institute and we'll put the links to our social media into the show notes. Thank you both for joining me. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you for having. Thank you.